evening. Let's take our Bibles and open up to uh, Numbers chapter 22. And actually, if you can get another scripture in your hand, let's look in Revelation 13 and verse 16. Revelation 13, 16. We'll start there and read a verse or two and you can be seated and then we'll get to Numbers 22 before long. If you listen real quick tonight, this shouldn't take long at all. Revelation 13 and verse 16. Let's read what the Bible says here. Revelation 13, 16 says, And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Father, Lord, we ask that you would come and help us tonight. Lord, bless us. Lord, we're your people. This is your word. This is your time, and this is your place. Lord, and we ask us that you would give us your ears and your heart and your grace to be able to receive the word of God as it is written in truth and in power for instruction and righteousness. Lord, that we can be thoroughly furnished in everything unto every good work. And in Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. In Revelation 13 and verse 16, it says that he caused all to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. I want to look just a little bit tonight about the mark talked about in the Bible. Now, that being said, it's not at all what you're probably thinking of. We want to look at a mark that the scripture speaks of. These, as you know, are uncertain times. They are unprecedented times like we've never seen before. There are things going on right now that we don't have a good reference point for because we nor anybody in recent history or maybe history at all has ever been through another time that is exactly like this time that we are going through. And clearly we are approaching the end times that the Bible speaks about. And we know with a certainty, while we look around in this world and people struggle to make sense of what this means or does this mean something or could this be that or or what do you think about this or is this fulfillment of one thing that we know is that the Bible speaks of some things that will come to pass and one of these things that will come to pass is people will receive a mark now that being said that mark is one that I hope nobody in this building ever receives however I would like to look for just a few minutes tonight about a mark that I believe every child of God needs to have. We'll get to Numbers 22 in just a few verses, but if you will, just listen quickly to a few things here as I read them. In Genesis 4, in verse number 15, the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. You know the story. We won't spend much time repeating it. You can read a lot of commentaries on this. There are a lot of uh, Jewish uh, theologians that believe this mark was the mark tav. It was kind of in the uh, symbolism of the cross or protection or a mark. And um, it's, uh, you, there, there's a lot that could be said about that. But Jesus said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Now, he said that in Greek as Alpha and Omega are the beginning and the last letters. If he were to have said that in the Hebrew, he would have said, I am the Aleph and the Tav. Aleph is, uh, means ox. It symbolizes an of a, of a oxen like for sacrifice. And Tav is a mark and perhaps the mark of a cross from what a lot of people think. But here in uh, Genesis 4, the, uh, the Word of God says that God set a mark upon Cain. That was his protection, lest anybody that should find him and knew what he did who would rise up and slay him okay listen to this verse in Ezekiel uh, chapter number nine it says uh, in verse number four the Lord said unto him go through the midst of the city through the midst of Jerusalem and set a mark upon the foreheads skipping down a few verses in verse six it says slay utterly old and young both maids and little children and women but come not near any man upon whom is the mark and begin at my sanctuary. 
Now, that's a little bit interesting uh, verse right there. And again, we aren't going to dwell on that long. But the point that I want you to take away from there is that the Bible projects uh, this thing of a mark being placed for protection. Now, with that as the introduction, it's kind of interesting. I, uh, this is something I had studied a while back and... Uh, and I, was, I spent hours studying on a different message for tonight, but it seems like that was not the, what the Lord had. But tonight, I think we want to look at this for a few minutes and trace the mark. And specifically, I want to look at the mark of the cross. And in doing this, the angle that we're going to come from tonight is looking what the Bible has to say about a donkey. Now, the words the Bible uses for donkey in the scriptures, it says donkey, it says colt, it says ass, it says foal, it says foal of an ass. All of these words like this are all talking about this creature. Now, there is one thing as I started looking about the donkey. I don't know if you've uh, ever seen before or not, um, but a donkey is a creature that has a very unique aspect about it. Not sure if you can see this. This is a baby donkey. This is a baby colt, a baby foal. And you can see uh, maybe there that there is a dark stripe that runs along the back from its shoulders all the way to the tailbone. And then there is another stripe that goes across it from shoulder to shoulder. This here is another, um, this here is another picture kind of looking from the top on the back of a donkey. And so it has a long black mark that goes from, from the base of its neck all the way to its tailbone and as another black mark that goes from one shoulder all the way over to the other shoulder. Now, if you look at this creature, it has this distinguishing feature no matter where or what variety of these you find anywhere in the world. Now, all donkeys across the world have this dark cross on their back, running down their spines and across their shoulder. Now, there's some of them, sometimes you can't see it because of the hair coloring that is on top. Oftentimes you can. The hair is dark and you can see the exact resemblance of the cross. But this here is what uh, the Western Australia Donkey Society president, I didn't even know there was a Western Australia Donkey Society president, but this is what she said. They've all got the mark of the cross. Even the dark colored ones, in other words, the dark ones that would have black fur where you couldn't see the black in it. She says, if you shaved their fur, you would find the cross permanently upon their skin. Now, with that thought, we'd like to follow the donkey, follow the mark, follow the mark of the cross for just a few minutes through the scripture. In Genesis, I mean, in Exodus 13, 13, don't turn there, just listen to this scripture quick. You all know it. And the firstling of an ass thou shalt redeem with a lamb. And if thou wilt not redeem it, then thou shalt break his neck, and all the firstborn of man among thy children shalt thou redeem. Here we get the connection of an ass, a donkey. It says redeem with a lamb. It actually uses the word redeem three times. So here in this verse, we get a thrice-fold redemption. It speaks of redemption three times pertaining to a lamb being slain to redeem a donkey. Okay. Um, in Genesis 49, again, just listen to this verse here. Genesis 49 and verse 10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Notice this is interesting what it says next. Binding his foal unto the vine, and his ass's colt unto the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine, and his clothes in the blood of grapes. Now, this here is the prophetic statement in Genesis speaking over the children of Israel, and it says concerning Judah, the scepter shall not depart from Judah. Now, we know that our Lord Jesus Christ was of the lion of the tribe of Judah. Now, in this prophecy, it speaks of this. It says, it says nor a lawgiver between his feet shall come, gathering of the people. And then it says, binding his foal unto the vine, and his ass's colt unto the choice Vine. So we see a donkey, a foal, a young donkey that has been bound to a vine and his ass is colt unto a choice vine. Now to make it even a little clearer for us, the connection between a donkey and the vine and one who could come forth from the tribe of Judah, it says he washed his garments 
in wine. What is the wine? Well, it is obviously the pressing of the grape that comes from the vine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. Now, there's a lot that could be said right here, but we're going to move on quickly. But just note that connection between the binding of his foal unto the vine. When Jesus Christ came into this world, he didn't come in this world to do his own will. But it says, I come to do thy will, O my God. In the volume of the books it is written of me. When he came into this world, he came with one thing on his heart's intent, on his mind. The whole reason he was birthed into this fallen, cursed humanity of a world was to see through to the finish, the final redemption of mankind. And it was his goal and lot in life, this scepter that shall come forth out of Judah to bind that foal under the vine, to wash his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. And we see in Revelation 19, 13, he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the word of God. And again in Isaiah 63, Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Bozrah? Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel and thine garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat? So here, I know that was a lot of verses to run through quick, but the things that we've looked at are a mark a mark that is placed for protection. We've looked at this donkey, this coal, this foal, this, this foal of an ass that the Bible talks about. And we've seen about how the Bible sets it up as a picture of redemption. In speaking of that, it seems to bind this foal to a vine. And it speaks of the one coming from the tribe of Judah, bound from this coal to the vine with a wine press of his clothes. And that references to that wine press of the clothing as his vestures dipped in blood, the pure blood of the grape. Okay. Now, if you're still in Numbers chapter 22, let's look in Numbers 22 and verse number 21. This is a familiar story. I'm sure everybody knows. So we won't give a lot of background. We'll just jump into it in Numbers 22 and verse number 21. A story of Balaam. Balaam rose up in the morning and saddled his ass. Okay, so here we have our animal. And went with the princes of Moab. God's anger was kindled because he went. Angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against him. Okay, notice there was an adversary that came up. Immediately after that it says, Now he was riding upon his ass and his two servants were with him. Okay, we see here, God's anger was kindled because he went. And it said all of a sudden he found that there was an adversary in the way. Right after that, the Bible says now he was riding his ass. Okay, well that's a good detail. But it says it right after it speaks of the adversary. Now there was an adversary that came up in the way, but he's riding his ass. In other words, there is an adversary that has come up in the way, but he is sitting up on the cross. He is on his ass, he is on his donkey, and he is literally sitting and riding upon this beast of burden, and he is sitting upon the cross. Here in verse 23, And the ass saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and his sword drawn in his hand, and the ass turned aside out of the way and went into the field. Balaam smote the ass to turn her into the way. But the angel of the Lord stood in a path of the vineyards. I never noticed this until I read this passage right here. But here we're about to get all of these connections in here again with Judah and the animal and the cross and protection and the mark and the vineyards and all of these things. But the angel of the Lord stood in a path of the vineyards, a wall being on this side and a wall on that side. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she thrust herself into the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall and he smote her again and the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn either to the right hand or to the left I see this very interesting Balaam is riding on his horse and he was probably riding on his donkey here sitting on the back of his beast 
probably just kind of going along, kind of, you know, you get in this day's driving sometimes and you kind of wake up and realize you've gone five miles and don't really remember many of the details about the last five miles. So I'm sure he was kind of in this lope just plodding along on his donkey and just kind of getting in the old donkey trance going along the road on the long dusty road there. And all of a sudden there is an adversary that pops up in the way. Well, he smites his animal to try to get it to go around and this animal takes and all of a sudden this adversary that is in the way there are things coming up that Balaam didn't even realize where he was at and he shook his head and where have I been the past five miles what what have I come into but all of a sudden there is a wall on one hand and there is a wall on another hand in a very very narrow place and it says that this donkey that he is riding comes up with this adversary in the way and the donkey comes and goes mm, and shoves his ankle, his foot, into the wall. It says in verse 25, she thrust herself into the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall and he smote her again. Now, this reminds me of a prophecy that was written in Genesis 3.15 that says, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed and it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. We're starting to get the picture coming together here of the cross. But what we see so far is we see Balaam who is riding upon the cross. Now Balaam is an odd guy and he kind of goes both ways sometimes and, but there is a lot that we can learn from him because we're, uh, we're kind of odd creatures ourselves at times too and we seem to have trouble staying pointed in the right direction. But here with Balaam he is riding upon the cross and that is something he has going for him. He is tied to the mark of the cross and now when the adversary comes up in the way he doesn't have the discernment to know that this is an angel of the Lord and and that the only thing that is protecting him from being devoured by this flaming angel in the way and killing him on the spot is the donkey, the cross that he is riding upon. And even though he is kind of zoned out and not paying attention to what's going on, he is at least on the cross. And as such, when he is on the cross and an adversary comes up in the way, the cross now is becoming his protection and is seeing what he cannot see. You see, this adversary adversary that came up. It was something that the donkey could see. It is something that the cross could see. But it is not something that Balaam was in a position to see. Now sometimes men see these adversaries that come against them. And sometimes we don't. There are things in our life that the Lord lets us see that is coming against us. And other times there are waves that come against us. There are darts that are being shot at us. And we don't have any idea where they're coming from. But we feel the sting when they penetrate. And we feel that we are in the middle of a battle. Now one thing that you can hope for, one thing you can put your salvation in is if you are upon that cross and next to the blood of Jesus Christ it will be able to see that adversary that you may not be able to see with these eyes. There was once a battle and they say, well look at them, there will only be so many of us and look how many of them. And as the Lord opened his eyes and he opened the eyes and around there was a whole innumerable and company of angels and warriors around. You see we just can't see it. But rest assured there is more that we cannot see going on in this house tonight than the things that we can see. And one thing that we know for sure that you have got to have to make it through this life without being slain and killed in the way is to stay upon the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you are upon that cross, it will see things and protect you from things that you had no idea you even needed protected from. Just stay upon the cross. Now this plays into the prophecy of where it says that the serpent, that old devil, would crush the heel of the Son of God. But that same heel would come down and deal a crushing blow to the head of the serpent. Look here in Numbers 22 and verse 27. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she fell down under Balaam. And Balaam's anger was kindled. He smote the ass with a staff. He was in a sore position right here. He obviously wasn't walking close enough with God or something, or maybe this was just a, a decept, a something that he could not even see, that the Lord was teaching him a lesson, but he had absolutely no idea what the mark of this cross was protecting him from. 
Uh, verse 27, uh, when he saw the ass, he fell down. Balaam's anger was kindled, smote the ass. Verse 28, the Lord opened the mouth of the ass, and she said unto Balaam, What have I done unto thee that thou hast smitten me these three times? And Balaam said unto the ass, Because thou hast mocked me, I would there were a sword in mine hand, for I would kill thee. Now this is almost a comical set of events that's going on. If you're riding a donkey and you should, you're angry with a donkey and you smite the donkey and then it falls down and then all of a sudden a donkey says, what have you just done beating me these three times? My first response wouldn't be to answer him back and continue the conversation. It would be, what did I just hear? Did your donkey lips just say human words to my ears? Am I, am I dreaming? What is going on? This is getting crazier and crazier. But Balaam is such in a state of disillusionment and not even knowing what's going on that he just talks right back to the donkey. And he said, well, it's because thou hast mocked me. I would there were a sword in mine hand, for now I would kill thee. So the conversation continues. The ass said unto Balaam, Am not I thine ass upon which thou hast ridden ever since I was thine unto this day? Was I ever wont to do so unto thee? Now the donkey said, Balaam, I was your little donkey ever since the day I was born. And here you've been riding on me all this time. I never wanted to kill you. What do you want to kill me for? Again, we have the conversation going on and the donkey is speaking Balaam's language. Well, here's something very interesting. Notice in verse 30, uh, the end of verse 30, what Balaam says. And he says, Nay. <laughs> I think sometimes the Lord has a sense of humor. Here, ba the donkey started speaking Balaam's language, and Balaam is talking right back, and then he starts talking donkey, donkey language. Verse 31, Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam. He saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, his sword drawn in his hand, and he bowed down his head, fell flawed on his face. The angel of the Lord said unto him, Wherefore hast thou smitten thine ass these three times? Behold, I went out to withstand thee, because thy way is perverse before me. The ass saw me and turned from me these three times, unless she had turned from me, surely now also I had slain thee and saved her alive. Balaam said unto the angel of the Lord, I have sinned, for I knew not that thou stoodest in the way against me. Now therefore, if it displease thee, I will get me back again. The only thing that we can cling to for our protection in these days is get me back again to the cross and stay with the cross. And when the cross tries to take us one way or when the cross prevents us from going so much further or the cross sees something that we don't, we don't have to understand, we don't have to try to figure it out, just stick with the cross. There's only two animals that I could find. Uh, maybe there's more. If there is, uh, please tell me after the service. But there's only two animals that I could find that ever spoke in the Word of God. Now, the, the cock crew for Peter, but I don't think it said words. It just crowed like God said it would, and it pricked his heart. But as far as I know, there's only two animals that spoke human words in the Bible. And the one was the serpent that spoke from a tree when it lured the first Bride of Adam, the first, the bride of the first Adam into the damnation of sin. The second animal that talked, of course, was this donkey. And it is associated with a tree and with redemption and with the drawing of a bride of the second Adam into redemption from sin. Now, in Zechariah 9, 9, listen to this verse. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, shout. O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass, and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Now, what is this talking about? Well, obviously, this is the prophecy of our Lord Jesus Christ. When the Lord Jesus Christ came into the world, we all know the story. He came and was put into a virgin's womb. There was a call that went out that all should report to be taxed. Mary and Joseph, they went. Joseph set Mary, being great with child, set her upon the back of a donkey, the back of an ass. And as the Lord Jesus Christ was in his mother's womb, as he was coming to bridge the great divide, to cross the divide from heaven down into the earthly realm, along the whole way in his mother's room, he was abreast 
of the cross. And it was the cross that brought him into this, this world. In Matthew 21, in verse 1, When they drew nigh unto Jerusalem and were come to Bethphage and to the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway you shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. If any man say aught unto you, ye shall say, The Lord hath need of him of them. Straightway he will send them. This was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass, and the colt, and a colt, the foal of an ass. This is when he is making what we know, what we call the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, just right before the crucifixion was about to happen. When he came this time, he said, go, and you will find a colt tied. It says, if somebody say unto you, what are you doing? Why are you taking this colt? Say, the master has need of it and bring it. Now, every indication was that the donkey that Mary rode was probably a full-size donkey. It had to carry a burden for a long way. This, it says, was the coal, the foal a colt of an ass, a very young donkey. Perhaps this one had never even had anybody ride upon it. I've heard pre 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 the messages before that perhaps this donkey had never even been redeemed with a lamb. But yet it was okay because the lamb was about to redeem this donkey. But whatever the case, the Lord Jesus had picked out a very young foal, a colt of an ass, to make his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Now, if you were the king of all glory, seeking an animal to ride upon, to make a grand and glorious entrance before the people, probably a baby colt would not be the most prestigious, dignified, flashy, bold, strong animal you could think of. But see, the Lord Jesus Christ, he said, your strength is made perfect in weakness. And once again, we see the Lord Jesus Christ, as he is about to bridge the divide yet again and bring a cross between fallen man and redeeming that fallen man back to his holy, righteous father. We see that he came in on the back of a cross. We see now that he again on the back of a cross is coming into Jerusalem where he himself is about to bear that cross and bear the marks of that cross in his own body on the tree. The Lord Jesus Christ on a colt, the little colt bearing up the Son of God, the little mark of his cross on his back. The Bible says, what is man like a, like a wild ass's colt kicking himself up into the wind? Right. It speaks of the rebellion of mankind. And yet the cross is able to take the rebellion of man, put it under the blood of Jesus Christ, and redeem him, redeem him, kicking up and snuffing up his nose against the wind, to redeem him by the blood of the Lamb back to the Father. And here the Lord Jesus Christ is riding on the back of this little donkey into Jerusalem. He goes from Jerusalem, he goes to the cross, and he dies for the sin of every man, woman, boy, and girl. His entry into this world and his exit out of this world were both upon a donkey and both bore the mark of the cross. Now, he's going to come back one more time. This time he's coming back in great glory. This time he's coming back, the Bible says, on a white horse. Why would he come back now riding on something that doesn't have the mark of the cross on its back? Well, this time the mark of the cross wasn't below him. This time the mark of the cross was forever in him. It was graven in the palm of his hands. It was in his side. He said, Thomas, thrust your hand in. Put it into 
my side. And here we have the Lamb of God, the scepter that came forth out of the tribe of Judah, and he has been bound under the vine. The vine speaks of the winepress, the crushing of the blood, the wrath, the treading of the winepress, and the wrath of Almighty God. And he bore that wrath for each and every one of us. And now he is coming back, not on the foal, not on a donkey, not on the foal of an ass, but he is coming back on that white stallion. But bless God, here's still the mark of the cross is there, even stronger than ever. And he's coming in with a vesture dipped in blood. And upon his thigh is a name written. And he is the word of God. That he is coming back. And I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. And, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. This is the mark of the cross. This is the mark given to us for protection. In these days and time that we live, there is not much that is certain. But we know for certain that the mark of the cross is enough for anything we are to face. In conclusion of the message, I know this is short tonight, but in conclusion of the message, one we want to look at one thing that his disciples came to him. It says, in fact, the disciples came unto him privately saying, Tell us what shall be the sign of thy coming and, and of the end of the world. The first thing Jesus said, Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Before he gave him any signs, before he talked of this or that, before he said what was going to come to pass and all of these things, he just said something real simple. Take heed that no man deceive you. We know that the devil is a liar and he's the father of it. We know that, that Jesus is truth and he is the father of it. One thing real interesting I found, you hear people talk about the law of first mention and things where the first mention of a particular word in Scripture often sets the precedent for how it is used and kind of the ultimate fulfillment of it in the Word of God. And many times that holds true. I looked up the word deceive. There's many forms of deceive, 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 deceiving, deceivableness, de deceit, uh, lie, uh, all kinds of things. But the word, the exact word deceive the first time that it shows up in Scripture is 2 Samuel 3.25. And it says, Thou knowest Abner. I looked up Abner. It means enlightenment. Father of light. Kind of like Lucifer. The son of Ner. That he came to deceive thee. And to know thy going out. And thy coming in. And to know all that thou doest. There's a lot that we could say there, but we'll pass over that for now. That's very interesting that the first time deceive shows up, it shows up as somebody meaning enlightenment is coming to, came to deceive, came to know when you went in, came to know when you go out, and came to know all that thou doest. There are three deceitful lies of the devil. Number one, it's not that bad. Number two, you have more time. Number three, it happened to others, but it won't happen to you because you're different. They said, Lord, they came to him privately, the disciples. Lord, when's the end going to be? And, uh, and, and, and tell us about these things. What do we need to know? The first thing he said be not deceived. That tells me that in these end times specifically, the main tactic of the devil is deceit. Now, there is one thing that is so tricky about deceit. If he said, Beware, at the end of the world, take heed that ye enter not into adultery. That'd be pretty easy to put your finger on. Because you yourself, nobody else may know, but you yourself know 
if you are involved in adultery. Many other things we could give examples of. But when it comes down to deception, the most deceitful thing about deception is you don't know if you have it. In fact, if you think that you do not have it, you are exactly in the place of setting yourself up that you could be one that is deceived. Because if you know you have it, you are not. But if you don't know that you have it, by the very definition, deceived as you think you know something, you think you can trust something, you think you believe something, you've seen something, you think you've seen something, and you believe it. And there's no question in your mind that it could be false. That is a very serious thing. Again, we won't wax long on that tonight. But you know in this day and age that because you see a photo of something, it could have been photoshopped. Because you see something written, it could have been written from a deceitful perspective. Because you read a first-hand account of something, it could have been written with an ulterior motive. You can't even trust a video these days. The deep fake technology and things that they have with artificial intelligence and machine learning and, and, and neural networks and all of these things, they can make it look like you are with another person in some other place with words coming out of your mouth that are looking like you said them and it not be you. If you come to terms and think about all that, that you can't believe what you read, you can't believe what you see a picture of, you can't necessarily believe what you see in a video. And I got to thinking to myself, what is there that I really know what do I know that I know that I have not seen coming from a screen, coming from a picture, or coming from something that was written by man? When you get to thinking about that in yourself tonight as you're laying on your bed, about 98% of what you think you know, you have to admit there could be the potential that that was deception. Now, that's all we'll say about that. But if you come down to, okay then, what is there that we can trust? Well, there is one person and only one person that you can without reservation hold in truth of a surety. And it's the one that said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is one book, and there is only one book that you can take without reservation and fully embrace and anchor your soul in that it is truth without error and without deceit or lie. And the Bible says in John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. And there is one spirit and there is only one spirit that you can without reservation be around, be consumed with, be exposed, be exposed to, be under the influence under and bring you to truth. And that is the Holy Spirit of God. Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. In a world where there are many things that are uncertain, and when you get right down to it, in a world where most of what we think we believe could in fact be a deception of the devil, there is one person there is one word and there is one spirit who you can know without a shadow of a doubt that you never have to question if it is truth and i can stand here assuredly tonight and say i know that i know that i know what is in this book is true and i know that my redeemer lives i know that he went to the cross and died for my sin and i know he's coming again and i know by the spirit of god bearing witness with my spirit that I am born again and that my hope is in heaven one day. Now if you do not know that you know that you know that there is a man, there is a spirit, and there is a book that you can 
come to. And you know, the thing about all three of those, about the spirit, the book, and the man, they all will bring you to the cross, to the mark of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Church, whether or not we realize it, we're in a battle. We're in a battle that a lot of people don't even realize. But the battle is real. And the battle is fierce. And the battle isn't fun and games. The devil is playing for keeps and he's taking prisoners. The devil doesn't have any doubts about he, how he's been ramping up the battle to bring about the consummation of all things towards the end times. Now we know that he is just a pawn working in the hand of Almighty God. And there is nothing that is going to happen that is outside of his control. And we even know that all these things must come to pass in order to fulfill the will of God. But yet there has never been a time that the devil, I believe, is more alert and aware of the battle. And never been a time where the church of God is more numbed into a, a, com a perceived complacency where they think they are alive and doing well and know the truth and they are rich and increased with goods and they have need of nothing. But the Bible said that we are wretched and vile and poor and naked. He said, come buy of me gold refined in the fire. The church of God is treating this lackadaisically and lazy and we are just sailing through. Nobody's looking for God to come anymore. Mostly people aren't looking for God to come. Why should we? What does he have that we don't need? For the most part, we have got everything that we need. The average man on the street, he's got clothes on his back. He's got food. He's got reasonably good health. Up until a few months ago, the economy, the world, it's going on as it ever have. Why do we really hunger after the Lord coming back to get us? Church, the devil is working overtime. Amen. We're in a battle. Amen. We are in a battle. And it as such as the adversary has begun, the last cards being played. The adversary has begun the last of the deceitful tactics being rolled out. It says so deceitful that if it were possible, even the very elect would be deceived. That tells me it's not going to be easily discernible. That tells me you are probably not going to come to church on Sunday mornings, never open your Bible during the week, and be able to discern the things that are happening. In fact, I believe the only way that any of us are going to escape from the deception is to personally, that means you and your Bible, get together and open it up and pray before God and say, God, I don't want to be deceived. Drop the scales from my eyes. Lord, I'm upon the cross. Lord, I want the cross and the blood to do my speaking for me. When the adversary is coming against me, Lord, my trust is in the blood. Lord, despite what this world says, and does and mandates and what direction it wants me to go I am going to stay upon the mark of the cross the only way that you are going to make it through not deceived is by having a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ hearing what your mom and dad said your Sunday school teacher said your preacher said hearing what others say that's all good we're not supposed to trust in man no. anymore. I don't believe, fully believe anything I see, I hear, somebody else tells me. I open up this word of God. I say, Lord Jesus Christ, <laughs> this is the truth. I've anchored myself in this truth. I don't know the way, but I know who is the way. And you are the way. And you are the truth. And you are my life. And I know that you're coming back to get me. And this will keep us from deception. This will take us through. Lord, we thank you for tonight. Lord, we thank you.
that we stand under the banner of the cross. Lord, that though the world is going downhill, Lord, though the devil is working overtime, God, the battle is real. Lord, keep us close to the cross. Lord, keep us under the blood. Keep us close to the banner of the cross. Lord, be thou our shield, our strong tower, our reward. God, you fight against the wicked one, the enemy of the devil. Lord, we plead that blood over this church. We plead the blood over the body. Lord, and I plead that blood and the mark of the cross over our pastor tonight. Lord, that you would hedge him about and give him wisdom. Give him your protection. Father, we need you in these days. God, open the eyes of your people that we will get on our knees and stay close to your word and get in the battle for almighty God. Lord, we thank you. We stay here tonight. Our only hope, our only hope leaving here, our only hope tonight, our only hope tomorrow, our only hope to carry us through is the mark of the cross. But the cross is enough. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.